If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the latest episode of Outbreak News Interviews. Now in the spring of 2012... A Saudi Arabian man developed symptoms resembling severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS. Some of you may remember that. However, it wasn't caused by the SARS coronavirus. Instead, it was identified as a new coronavirus named the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS coronavirus. Uh, Globally, since 2012, there's been more than 2,000 laboratory-confirmed cases of MERS to include more than 700 deaths that have been reported to the World Health Organization. Now here to discuss MERS, its short history, and to answer the question, will MERS ever spread out of the Arabian Peninsula such that the rest of the world should be concerned, is Michael Osterholm, PhD. Dr. Osterholm is the director of SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota and author of the book, Deadliest Enemy, our war against killer germs. Dr. Osterholm, welcome back to the podcast, sir. Thanks, Robert. Good to be with you. Great. Now, let's go ahead and start out with just a little bit of history to remind the audience on MERS. And uh, what are some of the things that we've learned since 2012? Well, first of all, the family of coronavirus is a, a term that comes from the fact that they look like they have kind of a corona effect if you look at them in an electron micrograph because of little spikes that come out of it, um, really are a family of viruses that appear to cause a very similar illness in humans, meaning that of, uh, as you talked about earlier, the severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. And MERS is really, in a sense, a very similar illness to SARS. And what we now know is that, in fact, these coronaviruses all likely originate out of bat populations and get into humans through other animal populations uh, who are infected then have contact with humans, or rarely it's possible that they come directly from bats. But uh, uh, this is a family of viruses we're going to see uh, more and more in the future, and we should not be surprised if uh, tomorrow there's a third coronavirus that ends up becoming a human pathogen of real significance. And uh, Dr. Osterholm, what have we learned about this virus since 2012? It, the MERS well, virus, all, it, it appeared on the scene we, in 2012, but we've learned quite a bit since then. Yeah. We actually have learned quite a bit. And as you mentioned, you talked about the number of cases that have occurred. And they, first of all, they primarily have occurred uh, in the Middle East, specifically on the Arabian Peninsula. And this is uh, for one important reason, is that the animal reservoir today that we're most concerned about are actually dromedary camels. And uh, if you look at camels across the board, meaning both dromedary and backroom camels around the world, they get infected with coronaviruses. And again, likely bats are the source for them also. Uh, but there was something that happened with the coronavirus in camels in, in the Middle East uh, about three to four years ago, in which there was a change that occurred in the virus that now also caused it uh, to, to result in this MERS-like illness when people were infected. We have data today from Africa where there's also uh, additional large camel populations, and we're not seeing the MERS illness. And yet when we look at antibody in these camels, they surely have evidence of a MERS-like virus. So if I had to kind of frame this in a, in a conceptual basis, I think that what uh, we have right now is that the MERS virus evolved out of camel population in the Middle East into a human pathogen, which has not really yet moved outside of that uh, Arabian Peninsula area. And we can talk more about that in a minute, why that's important, because I think that is the next place when that virus moves from there into camels and places like the Horn of Africa that we're going to see 
a, a real increase in the number of cases. One question that is often asked, well, why can't we just end MERS like we did SARS? And as you may recall, when SARS happened, we early on identified that the likely source for the SARS virus in humans was in the markets, the Guangdong province of China, and in particular, several animals, palm civets and badger dogs, both which are actually rodents, which are uh, consumed for food. And when it was realized that they actually were, were carrying the virus, they were virtually eliminated out of these markets. Most of them were, were killed. And um, that stopped the ongoing transmission of the virus from animals to humans. Well, with camels, that's not going to happen. Uh, we're not going to put down these very valuable camels, uh, either from a financial standpoint or because of uh, uh, the unique nature of the animals they play in the Middle East. So we're, we're going to be stuck for a long time, at least till we get a vaccine that could be effective uh, against the MERS virus. We're going to be stuck in a position of seeing ongoing MERS virus transmission. Yeah. Now, we had at least one situation where there was a significant outbreak that occurred outside the Middle East, and that was in South Korea a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, Dr. Osterholm, what did we learn from that outbreak in, in uh, South Korea? Yeah, that was a very important outbreak. It actually occurred in an individual who had been in the Middle East, uh, had camel exposure, had come back to Seoul, and was seen in three different uh, hospitals over a period of several days, of which in, while in the hospital, he transmitted the virus to others. And in one particular hospital, there was substantial transmission. Um, what we now know is, is that the vast majority of people who develop uh, a MERS or SARS illness actually have only limited infectiousness, meaning that they may transmit to others, but in many cases, even if the best infection control practices are not used, you don't see transmission. Then we have some, a very small number, but some very important individuals we call super spreaders, right. which are individuals that may transmit to 20, 30, or 40 different people all in the same setting, uh, such as an emergency room. And that's what happened in Seoul, is that we saw a series of super spreading events, including the first individual who's transmitted, but then uh, individuals he transmitted to also were then super spreaders. Uh, I actually was involved uh, working in the outbreak investigation at Samsung Medical Center, one of the most modern hospitals in the world. It would rival anything we have here in the United States in terms of the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic or Johns Hopkins or any other major medical facility. And that virus took off in a busy emergency room, transmitted to other uh, patients as well as to healthcare workers, and ultimately ended up shutting down the Samsung Hospital almost for a better part of eight weeks. Uh, so this, this is inevitably going to happen elsewhere. We're going to see cases coming out of the Middle East, and even as long as that foci stays in those camels, it will make its way to other locations around the world via an infected individual who comes to those institutions. And so we shouldn't be surprised if one day right here in the United States we see a very large outbreak of MERS. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Okay, so you kind of really segued into the, the theme of the uh, interview today is, uh, Dr. Osterholm, how concerned should the world be about the spread of MERS outside the Arabian Peninsula? Well, I think uh, two things. First of all, let's just take the MERS virus as it is today. And we've really got two component pieces to that. One is the fact of ongoing transmission from patients on the Arabian Peninsula. But if you look today at the camel trade, and I mentioned before that uh, uh, you know, the camels on the Arabian Peninsula are only about 1.5 million in number, but that if you look at overall, there are over 24 million camels in Africa, of which the vast majority of them are actually in countries like Somalia, which has over 7 million camels. And today, camel trade is one that is almost a one-way street from Africa to the Arabian Peninsula. Well, the virus is in the Arabian Peninsula. It's not moving out in a sense because camels aren't being sold from Saudi Arabia, for example, to, to Somalia. But it's just a matter of time before that happens, uh, where a, the virus makes its way from the Arabian Peninsula and gets into the Horn of Africa. And when that happens, all bets are off. Uh, we could see a very substantial explosion of cases in uh, Eastern Africa, particularly in the Horn of Africa, in areas where the conditions uh, medical-wise to treat these patients or even detect them initially from a public health standpoint will be very limited. Um, this could be a really dramatic situation, one that I have said, and I mentioned this in the book and go into some detail about it, could easily rival what we saw on the western side of Africa with Ebola. 
And I think it's just a matter of time. This virus is going to make its way from the camels, the Raven Peninsula, to the camels of Africa. So that one is a real challenge. Of course, we will still continue to have the challenge of then the transmission that occurs with that one patient, two patients that come out of the Middle East and go into hospitals around the world like we saw in uh, uh, the Samsung Medical Center uh, Seoul, Korea outbreak. And we also saw with SARS, when SARS emerged uh, in China, of course, we saw the hospital outbreaks, particularly in countries like Canada. Now, the second area, though, that I think is really important here is why we need to be better prepared uh, for coronavirus-like infections is we know that bats today around the world uh, particularly in the tropical rainforest areas, harbor a number of similar coronaviruses, that any one of them could become the next uh, coronavirus infection in humans if it makes its way to humans through bats or through another animal species. So, uh, you know, I think SARS and MERS are not just knockoff coronavirus infections, that that's it. Uh, we really, really need to be prepared for coronavirus infections in general. And it wouldn't surprise me if tomorrow we had a third new one up here or a fourth one or a fifth one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's just a matter of time, I think. So to close, um, what actions are we taking or should we be taking to prevent everything you mentioned from happening? Well, really the primary tool we're going to have uh, for our, our use is going to be vaccines. And right now there is work going on uh, with regard to a MERS-like vaccine. Uh, the International Vaccine Institute in, in Korea is actually working on one. Uh, the WHO roadmap process, which is a identification of high-priority pathogens for which then the WHO is developing roadmaps for uh, what type of vaccines, therapeutics, uh, and diagnostic tests we need for those, and MERS has been prioritized there. The, the challenge we have with, with uh, diseases like MERS, however, and we saw this with Ebola, and you and I have discussed this before, is there is not a big market for that right now. Who would buy it? Why would they use it? And so the science is only one part of the problem. Uh, I do believe we can find effective coronavirus vaccines, uh, potentially for humans, that uh, would in fact work. It's just, will the finances be there to bring them through? The second piece of this is also, well, maybe we could vaccinate the camels right. uh, and, uh, and in fact prevent them from transmitting onto humans by preventing camels from getting infected. And again, for the, for the listeners here, uh, it's of note that camels only at best have a mild, very moderately uh, debilitating illness. So uh, from their standpoint, uh, you know, it's not a big uh, issue for camel herders to have their camels uh, have a MERS-like illness. So, so I think it's going to be vaccines for humans and potentially for that of camels. And, uh, and I think we're going to need these same vaccines for any number of different coronaviruses as we go into the future. All right, well, good advice. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Mike Osterholm, for your time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks, Robert.